Good morning, everybody. We are on chapter 13 of Because of Winn-Dixie, and it is page 85. Me and Winn-Dixie got into a daily routine where we would leave the trailer early in the morning and get down to Gertrude's pets in time to hear Otis play the guitar music for the animals. Sometimes Sweetie Pie snuck in for the concert. She sat on the floor and wrapped her arms around Winn-Dixie and rocked him back and forth like he was a big old teddy bear. And then when the music was over, she would walk around trying to pick up which pet she wanted, but she always gave up and went home because the only thing she really wanted was a dog like Winn-Dixie. After she was gone, I would sweep and clean up and even arrange some of Otis's shelf because he did not have an eye for arranging things, and I did. And when I was done, Otis would write down my time in a notebook that he marked on the outside, one red leather collar, one red leather leash. And the whole time, he did not in any way ever act like a criminal. After working at Gertrude's Pets, me and Winn Dixie would go over to the Herman W. Block Memorial Library and talk to Miss Franny Block and listen to her tell us a story. But my favorite place to be that summer was in Galoria Dump's yard. And I figured it was Winn Dixie's favorite place to be too, because when we got up to the last block before her house, Winn Dixie would break away from my bike and start to run for all he was worth, heading for Gloria Dump's backyard and his spoonful of peanut butter. Sometimes Dunlap and Stevie Dewey would follow me. Then they would holler, there goes the preacher's daughter visiting the witch. She's not a witch, I told them. It made me sad the way they wouldn't listen to me and kept on believing whatever they wanted to believe about Gloria Dump. One time, Stevie said to me, my mama says you shouldn't be spending all your time cooped up in the pet shop and at the library sitting around talking with old ladies. She says you should get out in the fresh air and play with kids your own age. That's what my mama says. Oh, lay off her, Dunlap said to Stevie, and then he turned to me. He don't mean it, he said. But I was already mad. I shouted at Stevie and I said, I don't care what your mama says. She's not my mama and she can't tell me what to do. I'm going to tell my mama you said that, shouted Stevie. And she'll tell your daddy and he'll shame you in front of the whole church. And that pet shop man is retarded and he was in jail. And I wonder if your daddy knows that. Otis is not retarded, I said. And my daddy knows that he was in jail. That was a lie, but I didn't care. And you can go ahead and tell on me if you want, you big bald-headed baby. I swear, it was about wore me out yelling at Dunlap and Stevie Dewberry every day. By the time I got to Gloria Dump's yard, I felt like a soldier who had been fighting a hard battle. Gloria would make me a peanut butter sandwich straight off, and then she would pour me a cup of coffee with half coffee and half, half milk, and that would refresh me. Why don't you play with them boys, Gloria asked me. Because they're ignorant, I told her. They still think that you're a witch. It doesn't matter how many times I tell them that you're not. I don't think they're trying to make friends with you in a, I think they're trying to make friends with you in a roundabout way, Gloria said. I don't want to be their friend, I said. It might be fun having them two boys for friends. I'd rather talk with you, I said. They're stupid and mean and they're boys. Gloria would shake her head and sigh. And then she would ask me what was going on in the world and did I have any stories to tell her? And I always did. Chapter 14. Sometimes I told Gloria the story Miss Franny Block told me that had just told me. Or I imitated Otis tapping his pointy-toed boots and playing all of, for all of the animals and that always made her laugh. And sometimes I made up a story and Gloria Dump would listen to it all the way through from beginning to end. She told me she used to love to read stories, but she couldn't anymore because her eyes were so bad. Can't you get some really strong glasses, I asked. Child, she said, they don't make glasses strong enough for these eyes. One day when the storytelling was done, I decided to tell Gloria that Otis was a criminal. I thought maybe I should tell an adult about it and Gloria was the best adult that I knew. Gloria, I said, mm-hmm, she said back, you know, Otis, I don't know him, but I know what you tell me about him. Well, he's a criminal. He's been to jail. Do you think I should be afraid of him? Well, whatever for. I don't know, for doing bad things, I guess, for being in jail. 
Child, said Gloria, let me show you something. She got up out of her chair real slow and took hold of my arm. Let's the two of us walk all the way to the backyard. Okay, I said. We walked and Winn Dixie followed right behind us. It was a huge yard and I had never been all the way back in it. When we got to the big old tree, we stopped. Look at this tree, Gloria said. I looked up. There were bottles hanging from just about every branch. There were whiskey bottles and beer bottles and wine bottles all tied on with string and some of them were clanking against each other and making a spooky kind of sound. Me and Winn Dixie stood and stared at the tree and the hair on the top of his head rose a little bit and he growled deep in his throat. Gloria Dump pointed her cane at the tree. What do you think about this tree? I said, I don't know. Why are all those bottles on it? To keep the ghosts away, Gloria said. What ghosts? The ghosts of all the things I'd done wrong. I looked at all the bottles on the tree. You did that many things wrong, I asked her. Mm-hmm said Gloria. More than that. But you're the nicest person I know, I told her. Don't mean I haven't done bad things, she said. There's whiskey bottles on there, I told her, and beer bottles. Child, said Gloria Dunlap, I know that. I'm the one who put them there. I'm the one who drank what was in them. My mama drank, I whispered. I know, Gloria Dump said. The preacher says that sometimes she couldn't stop drinking. Mm-hmm, said Gloria again. That's the way it is for some folks. We get started and we can't get stopped. Are you one of those people? Yes, ma'am, I am. But those day, these days, I don't drink nothing stronger than coffee. Did the whiskey and the beer and the wine, did they make you do the bad things that the ghosts are now? That are ghosts now? Some of them, said Gloria Dope. Some of them I would have done anyway, with alcohol or without, before I learned. Learned what? Learn what is the most important thing. What's that, I asked her. It's different for everyone, she said. You find out on your own. But in the meantime, you got to remember, you can't always judge people by the things they've done. You got to judge them by what they're doing now. You judge Otis by the pretty music he plays and how kind he is to them animals. Because that's all you know about him right now. All right? Yes, ma'am, I said. And them Dewberry boys, you try not to judge them too harsh either, all right? All right, I said. All right, then, said Gloria Dump, when she turned and started walking away. Winn Dixie nudged me with his wet nose and wagged his tail. When he saw I wasn't going, he trotted after Gloria. I stayed where I was, and I studied the tree. I wondered if my mama, wherever she was, had a tree full of bottles, and I wondered if I was a ghost to her, the same way she sometimes seemed like a ghost to me. Chapter 15 the Herman W. Block Memorial Library's air conditioning unit didn't work very good, and there was only one fan, and from the minute me and Winn-Dixie got in the library, he hogged it all. He lay right in front of it and wagged his tail and let it blow the fur all around. Some of his fur was pretty loose and blew right off him like a dandelion puff. I worried about him hogging the fan, and I worried about the fan blowing him bald, but Miss Fanny said not to worry about either thing that Winn-Dixie could hog the fan if he wanted, and she had never in her life seen a dog made bald by a fan. Sometimes when Miss Fanny was telling a story, she would have a fit. There were small fits, and they didn't last long. But what happened was she would forget what she was saying. She would just stop and start to shake like a little leaf. And when that happened, Winn-Dixie would get up from the fan and sit right at Miss Fanny Block's side. He would sit up tall, protecting her, and his ears standing up straight on his head, like soldiers. And when Miss Fanny stopped shaking and started talking again, Winn-Dixie would lick her hand and lie back down in front of the fan. Whenever Miss Fanny had one of her fits, it reminded me of Winn-Dixie and the thunderstorm. There were a lot of thunderstorms that summer, and I got a real good at holding on to Winn-Dixie whenever they came. I held on to him and comforted him and whispered to him and rocked him just the same way he tried to comfort Miss Franny when she had her fits. Only I held on to Win Dixie for another reason too. I held on to him tight so he wouldn't run away. It all made me think about Gloria Dump, and I wondered who confronted her, comforted her when she heard those bottles knocking together, those ghosts chattering about the things that she'd done wrong. I wanted to comfort Gloria Dump. And I decided that the best way that I could would be to would be to read her book, read her a book, 
read it to her loud enough to keep the ghosts away. And so I asked Miss Franny, I said, Miss Franny, I've got a grown up friend whose eyes are going on her and I would like to read her a book out loud. Do you have any suggestions? Suggestions, said Miss Franny. Oh, something's in my eye. Yes, ma'am. I have suggestions. Of course I have suggestions. How about Gone with the Wind? What's that about, I asked her. Why, said Miss Randy, it's a wonderful story about the Civil War. The Civil War, I asked. Do not tell me you've never heard of the Civil War. Miss Franny Block looked like she was going to faint. She waved her hands in front of her face. I know about the Civil War, I told her. That was a war between the South and the North over slavery. Slavery, yes, said Miss Franny. It was also about the state's rights and money. It was a terrible war. My great-grandfather fought in that war, and he was just a boy. Your great-grandfather? Yes, ma'am. Litmus W. Block. Now, there's a story. When Dixie yawned real big and lay down on his side with a thump and a sigh. I swear he knew that phrase. Now there's a story. And he knew it meant we weren't going anywhere real soon. Go ahead and tell it to me, Miss Franny, I said. And I sat down cross-legged next to Win Dixie. I pushed him and tried to get him to share the fan, but he pretended he was asleep and he wouldn't move. I was all settled in and ready for a good story when the door banged and pinched face Amanda Wilkerson came in. Win Dixie sat up and stared at her. He tried out a smile on her, but she didn't smile back, so he lay back down. I'm ready for another book, Amanda said, slamming her book down on Miss Franny's desk. Well, said Miss Franny, maybe you wouldn't mind waiting. I was telling India Opal a story about my great-grandfather. You are, of course, more than welcome to listen. It will just be one more minute. Amanda sighed a real dramatic sigh and stared past me. She pretended she wasn't interested, but she was, I could tell. Come sit over here, said Miss Franny. I'll stand, thank you, said Amanda. Suit yourself, Miss Franny shrugged. Now, where was I? Oh, yes, Litmus. Litmus W. Block. And that is the end of chapter 15.